Welcome to That's Good Sports. I'm your football idiot, Brandon Perna. Today, I want to talk about the 90s. In 1995, Mike Shanahan became the head coach of the Denver Broncos. In the next four seasons, the Broncos won two AFC West titles, made the playoffs three times, and won two Super Bowls. Now, the Broncos became the most dominant team in the NFL, but they didn't do it the traditional way. They did it differently. In fact, the way the Broncos assembled their Super Bowl squad wasn't much different from how the Oakland Athletics assembled a contender in the MLB thanks to a little philosophy called Moneyball. Maybe you've heard of it. Today, I'll show you how the Broncos took advantage of that philosophy on their way to winning back-to-back -back Super Bowls. That's today on Lots of Good Sports. Today's episode is sponsored by manscaped.com slash good sports. You may have noticed that uh, I got a haircut recently and that my face went through, uh, well, some looks last month. But now that I look like a respectable gentleman again, I'm feeling invigorated with a fresh cut and the perfect body cleansing kit thanks to Manscaped and their ultra premium collection. I did use the lawnmower 4.0 to mow down my massive beard and I'll be honest, the forest that overgrew in my pants, but I'm also really enjoying Manscaped on every inch of my body with their aluminum-free deodorant, body wash, and two-in-one shampoo and conditioner. Now, besides a random bar of soap that I use for an area I will not name, and a loofah, my shower looks like an ad for Manscaped. What I love about the shampoo and body wash is that it uses no synthetic chemicals and they've infused it with natural ingredients like coconut water and aloe vera to keep your skin and hair from drying out, like a running back's career after turning 30. I usually work out midday and don't shower until the evening, so the deodorant and body spray allow me to smell like a human for the rest of my workday. Upgrade your shower routine and toss your mismatched soaps and chemical-ridden washes for a refined signature shower routine with my link below for 20% off your order. Manscaped.com slash good sports. Now to understand what the Broncos did, you need to understand what Moneyball is. In 2002, author Michael Lewis followed Oakland A's general manager Billy Bean as he pulled the strings for baseball's most underfunded team. Lewis was gathering information for a book, a book that was trying to answer one question. How were the Oakland A's competing with teams like the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees, despite having a payroll one third of the size of their competitors. Like me, satisfying numerous women despite having a penis one third the size of a normal man. Uh, man. What kind of black magic were the A's pulling that defied traditional baseball logic and made their financial situation irrelevant? It turns out that Billy Bean and the A's were exploiting some inefficiencies created by the short-sightedness of other MLB franchises. For instance, while other teams saw batting average as the most important stat for judging a hitter, the A's put an emphasis on on-base percentage, a stat that tracks walks and hits combined. Other teams cared about a pitcher's earned run average, or ERA, while the A's paid attention to the three true outcomes, walks, strikeouts, and home runs. Because of their dire financial situation, the A's couldn't go out and sign stars. In fact, they had trouble keeping their own stars. They had to stack talent in the draft, and they had to go out and sign cheap players they believed were undervalued. Players like pitcher Chad Bradford, who threw with a weird sidearm motion that would make even Philip Rivers jealous. He threw a mid 80s speed fastball, but still got guys out. Jeremy Giambi, who was slow as hell and couldn't play the field to save his life, uh, but got on base like his older brother. David Justice, who was considered well past his prime by the rest of the MLB, but had a little bit of juice left to put the A's over the top. To the A's, on the surface, it didn't matter what a player looked like. He could be a schlub or a Greek god. Billy Bean himself was a top pick and a chiseled Adonis who never amounted to anything as a player in the MLB. He was baseball's version of Brady Quinn. 
It's all about the production on the diamond and the A's were the best at gauging performance via sabermetrics. Now, Michael Lewis's book was so popular and so influential that he admits that it might have hurt the athletics, uh, believing it provided a blueprint for other teams and whittled away at Oakland's competitive edge. But the book and the 2011 movie are so great and so universal because of some of the basic themes. Thinking outside of the box, questioning traditional processes, and seeing past appearances. That's something the Denver Broncos did probably by accident, and it made them a powerhouse in the late 90s. So let's talk about assembling the Broncos. Baseball and football are two sports that are incredibly hard to compare. Baseball is a series of isolated incidents that you can easily uh, attribute to individual players. There's only one guy at the plate, and whether or not he succeeds or fails is entirely up to him. Football, on the other hand, is the ultimate team game. Just ask Super Bowl champion Matthew Stafford. If a quarterback gets sacked, it could be because his left tackle got beat, or because his receivers couldn't get open, or because he tripped over his center's foot, or all three if you're Trevor Lawrence. Nothing exists in a vacuum in football. The stats don't tell you whether an interception was the fault of a quarterback or the wide receiver. You can't look at the box score and see that a kicker missed a field goal because the holder didn't spin the laces out. It's why we idolize guys like Brett Coleman who actually watch the tape. That's <laughs> something I never do. And show us who to really blame. Furthermore, the NFL has a hard salary cap, which leveled the playing field in pro football. Unlike baseball, which literally has a mound in the middle of the field, meaning it will never, ever be level. But like with most anything in life, you can apply some of the bigger principles of Moneyball to football, and that's how the Broncos built their team in the 90s. Outside of their quarterback, John Elway, who was drafted to play baseball and football, who they didn't draft, uh, they were not a team of stars. They were a team of outcasts and misfits who were cut by other teams, passed up in the draft, or never got their chance to shine in college. Even their head coach, Mike Shanahan, was a retread. Shanahan was the head coach of the Los Angeles Raiders in the late 80s, and yes, it is hilarious that after the Raiders moved back to Oakland, the stupidest team in the NFL shared a stadium with the smartest team in the MLB. Shanahan was fired just four games into his second season, not necessarily because he was a failure, but because of a feud between him and Al Davis. Shanahan rehabilitated his career as the OC in San Francisco, getting two MVPs and a Super Bowl victory out of Steve Young. When the Broncos fired Wade Phillips after the 1994 season, it made perfect sense to bring back Shanahan, who made a big impact in two different stints as an assistant for Denver. Shanahan got to Denver and brought a playmaker with him at wide receiver. No, it was not Jerry Rice, who did play for the Broncos for a bit, or John Taylor. It was a little known player by the name of Ed McCaffrey. McCaffrey was cut by the Giants, who had drafted him out of Stanford, and he was hidden behind Rice and Taylor, which deflated his numbers. There was nothing particularly sensational about him, but he could hold on to a football after taking a hit that would kill a normal human. And Shanahan valued that. Shanahan could have gone out and spent huge money on a star like Alvin Harper of the Cowboys, but he went for an undervalued wideout like Eddie Mack, who cost a fraction of the price. When Harper was out of the league, McCaffrey was still catching 100 passes and putting up a 1,000 yards in Denver with Brian Greasy. McCaffrey's running mate at wide receiver was Rod Smith. Stick with the home team. Who was a bigger underdog than just about anyone. Smith was undrafted out of Missouri Southern State in 1994 despite setting conference records for yards and touchdowns. Most teams saw an undersized player who ran a slow 40-yard dash, but once again, the Broncos, oh, they saw a guy who produced in spite of the limitations. 
More importantly, they were patient. Smith had some clutch moments early in his career, but he didn't even start until his fourth season in the league. An underrated aspect about McCaffrey and Rod Smith at a position that produces, well, the most divas in the league, those two guys had no ego. They excelled at blocking and they weren't selfish. Rod Smith never complained that he didn't get to catch a pass in Super Bowl 32. He still blocked his ass off and helped this team win. So did McCaffrey. Just ask Packers linebacker Brian Williams. Hell, ask former NBC Nightly News host Brian Williams. He'll remember, and if he doesn't, he'll pretend like he was there. Their teammate, Shannon Sharp, well, he had a bit of an ego, or at least a big personality, to be maybe more accurate. But it wasn't because he was getting praised his whole life. Sharp was a seventh round pick out of Savannah State. Despite having a brother, Sterling, who was lighting up the NFL, the younger Sharp, well, he was considered a tweener, meaning he was too slow to play wide receiver and he was too small to play tight end. He didn't really have a position, and in a way, he was like Jeremy Giambi, slower than his older brother, didn't have a natural position, but succeeded in spite of that. Now, some scouts thought he'd be an H-back in the NFL, but the Broncos made use of him at tight end. The tweener label was supposed to be a curse, but instead it turned out to be a blessing. Sharp was too fast for linebackers, too physical for defensive backs. He was less of a tweener and more of a matchup nightmare. <laughs> And if he played for the current Shanahan spawn in San Francisco, I'd imagine he'd be used a lot like Debo Samuel. Now the Broncos offensive line in the late 90s was an undersized ragtag group of misfits who refused to even talk to the media so they would avoid developing egos. Mark Schlereth was a 10th round pick who was cut by Washington. Brian Habib was a 10th rounder as well. Tom Nalen was a 7th round pick. And Tony Jones was an undrafted rookie. The only first round pick on the 97 Broncos line was Gary Zimmerman, who had to be coaxed out of retirement for one last shot at a ring. Together, no one on the Broncos offensive line hit 300 pounds on the scale. Back in an era where every other team in the NFL had at least two offensive linemen breaking three bills. Specifically the Cowboys, who broke the Bills a couple times. Most would have seen that as a weakness, but the Denver Broncos made it a strength, utilizing their agility and speed in a zone-blocking scheme that valued intelligence over raw size and power. Remember, you can be smart, but also weird, because these guys were gigantic weirdos and pretty disgusting, even for offensive linemen. Schlereth, aka Stink, famously peed his pants during games. So I'm sitting on the bench and I'm sitting with my guys and there's a couple other guys there and I'm like, man, I gotta go. And they're like, hey, you know, it's almost fourth quarter, you can just hold it. I go, no, I, I really gotta go. Nalen threw up before games and didn't let anyone wash his jersey and Brian Habib washed his car three times a day. Maybe the line was constructed after reading One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and not Moneyball. We might not have a big name like Tony Baselli or Jonathan Ogden or Larry Allen, but I promise there aren't five linemen who play better together, Shannon Sharp said. Those guys cleared the way for Terrell Davis, who despite being the biggest star on the Broncos in the late 90s, came from very humble beginnings like the rest of the offense. After head coach George Allen passed away, Terrell Davis's school, Long Beach State, folded its football program. Davis went to Georgia, where he was stuck behind Garrison Hurst for a year. When he finally got his chance, Davis kept getting injured and when he was healthy, his coach rarely utilized his skill set. In fact, Davis and head coach Ray Goff developed such a nasty feud that Goff refused to send TD's game bill to the NFL and NFL scouts. It also didn't help that Davis ran an abysmal 471 40 yard dash time at the combine. As a result, Davis fell to the sixth round with 21 running backs selected before him. Some call him the Tom Brady of running backs because he was taken in that sixth round. I don't, I'd never offend TD like that. Now the Broncos didn't care about the slow 40 time or the baggage with Ray Goff. They saw a guy who fit their scheme. When the Broncos put all of those pieces together, they had the most potent offense in the NFL. 
and the only first round pick they used to build it was when they traded for John Elway back in 1983. In fact, when you look back at the Broncos drafts in the 90s, you start to understand why they had to find talent in unconventional ways. The Broncos used first rounders on guys like Alton Montgomery, Mike Kroll, Tommy Maddox, Dan Williams, and Marcus Nash. None of those guys helped the Broncos win a Super Bowl. And Maddox was basically John Elway's Jordan Love. And yet, because they had gathered all of these hidden gems, especially on offense, they won back-to-back -back Super Bowls in 1997 and 98. The Oakland A's had their constraints, which was that they had next to no money. And the Broncos had their constraints, the fact that they couldn't draft in the first two rounds for about six years in the 90s. But hey, look at the Rams. They just won a Super Bowl. Who cares about the draft, right? And the Denver Broncos sort of reinvented how teams started to approach the running back position. Even after the glory days of the late 90s, the Broncos reinvented themselves, becoming the first team to prioritize their system over the individual running backs. After Terrell Davis's career came to a premature end, players like Olandis Gary, Mike Anderson, Clinton Portis, AKA Sipo, Ruben Drones, and Tatum Bell all produced thousand yard rushing seasons. Before the Broncos found success with their plug and play rushing attack, feature backs were a staple in the NFL. Today, running backs are rarely drafted in the top five, and there are plenty of analysts who believe you should never draft a running back in the first round, or give them a second contract, or even let them play football. Never invest resources in your running back. But you have to ask yourself this, do I wanna pay my running back? Probably not. But do I wanna pay somebody else's running back? That's an even worse decision. The Broncos were the first to expose that inefficiency and capitalize on it. They proved that with how they handled Clinton Portis. Portis was the rookie of the year and easily the best back Denver had seen since Terrell Davis. He was a revelation, one of a handful of players to ever score five touchdowns in a game, helping the Broncos beat the Chiefs in 2003. When asked about that, Portis said, how could I forget that game? It was the game that got me traded. Rather than making Portis the centerpiece of their offense, they used a trick the A's had been doing for years, the old pump and dump, which now as a dad really hits home. The A's were known for drafting and developing young players who turned into stars. When it was time to pay them, the A's flipped them to richer teams in return for more young prospects. They were a baseball player factory, and the Broncos were a running back factory. The Broncos didn't give Portis a second deal. Instead, they flipped him for Washington for a sixth year cornerback by the name of Champ Bailey, a Hall of Famer, a rare player for player trade, who would play a decade with the Broncos. They had learned a new truth about the game that other franchises would take another two decades to realize. Ruben Drones, fresh off a thousand yard season in 2004, was traded to the Browns at the peak of his value, netting defensive linemen Ebenezer Ecubon and Michael Myers, which sounds like the next Halloween movie, but set during Christmas. Mike Anderson left for free agency. Tatum Bell was traded for Dre Bly, proving once again that the Broncos valued defense over plug and play running backs. But even though they valued defense, that didn't mean the Broncos could find talent in the draft. The Broncos nailed the Champ Bailey trade and signed safety John Lynch in free agency, but whiffed on crucial draft picks like Willie Middlebrooks, Dorsett Davis, Terry Pierce, Jeremy Lesueur, and Jarvis Moss. Shanahan knew how to find value in the little nooks and crannies of the transaction wire, but he swung and missed on a lot of the team's crucial draft picks during his tenure as head coach slash GM, which was his ultimate downfall as the Broncos head coach. Mike Shanahan may not have gone out in a blaze of glory, and he never earned a lifetime contract with his team like Billy Bean and the A's, but Shanahan played his own version of Moneyball in the NFL. Then he went to Washington, and he played in the NFL's version of Hell. 
The point of this video is that you can be imperfect and still win in the NFL. You can think outside of the box and be rewarded for it. There's not one correct way to build a Super Bowl championship roster. You can do it by dominating the draft and you can do it by pretending the draft doesn't exist or plain sucking at it. Football, baseball, really every team sport rewards creativity and risk taking. Sometimes you can get a little too creative when it comes to building a roster and the NFL ends up fining you a million dollars and stripping a third round draft pick. But when your third round draft picks turn into Maurice Claret, who really gives a shit? Thanks for watching That's Good Sports. Please let me know if you like this style of video. I know it's a little different than what I normally do here, but if you want some more deep dives into interesting football things, like the video, let me know in the comments and what you might wanna see me do next.